good, fashioned in his image, bad, decided to go our own way, new. Where is this new? Well, it's not found in the substitute gods that we have embraced in the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st. We are raising generations of people who believe themselves to be born without reason, to prolong themselves by chance, and to die and just simply to go into oblivion. Is there any wonder that they find themselves alarmed as they ferret through social media, as they try and find an identity, try and create an identity, try and be a something, try and be a someone? Now we need to say to these people, do you understand that when you think about identity in terms of a biblical view, it's not an identity that we create. It is an identity that we receive. The senator mentioned it earlier on, saying he had discovered himself, irrespective of his family background, to be a child of the king, that he had a huge family, a global family, an interracial family, and all true because of the new. I don't know very much about art at all. I go to museums and go through them very quickly and then buy the book and read it on my own later so that I can say I was there and then I find out what it was that I wasn't looking at while I was there. <laughs> but there is, there is one painting that I do want to uh, find, and it's done by Gauguin, the post-impressionist painter, who died as a result of a dissolute life in the in the islands. He was brought up as a Roman Catholic. He was creedal in his education. And in the largest of these paintings that he ever did, which is in the Boston Museum of Fine Art, as it turns out, I haven't been, he actually did something that he doesn't do on his paintings, or he didn't do in his paintings. He wrote on them. And he wrote up in the top left-hand corner of the painting. I know because I've seen the photograph of it. I haven't seen the painting. Uh, what did he write? Well, he wrote, uh, Du venons nous, que sommes nous, ou allons nous? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Now, don't you think it's fair to be able to say to our friends and our neighbors, our family members, our work colleagues, my friend, if you do not have a worldview that can sufficiently answer those fundamental questions, I suggest to you it's time to consider another one. And I would like to encourage you to consider the possibility that in one of the songs from the 60s again in the Christian world, that Jesus is the answer for the world today, that he is the one who ushers in the new. He's the one that ushers in the new. When Peter writes about it, he says, Christ died for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God, to establish an entirely new relationship that Jesus came to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, that Jesus bore the punishment that we deserve in order that he might grant to us a forgiveness that we don't deserve. Now, it's relatively easy for these words to flow from my lips. But the fact of the matter is that what I have just said is immensely offensive in our day. In fact, in every day. It was so when Paul proclaimed the same message to the Corinthians. You remember, he says to them, this message of the cross is absolute foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, this message, which is at the heart of Christianity, which is the foundation of our view of things, is offensive to our neighbors and our friends because it accuses them in terms of their moral framework and in terms of their intellectual capacity. At least that's what I've discovered in talking with my friends. This is what they will say. What you're propounding, beg, is actually an insult to me, intellectually, first of all, because I want you to know that I am too intelligent to believe that stuff. Or it is an insult to me morally, ethically, 
because I am too good to need that stuff. So people basically are saying the, the kind of thing that is said when the average uh, uh, CEO in some organization has to have his photographs taken for the annual brochure, and uh, he sits down, and uh, his wife has got him as organized as possible, and uh, the, the photographer comes in, and the fellow says, now, I, I, I just hope that, uh, because this is a very important brochure, and uh, I hope that this will do me justice. To which the photographer says, sir, what you require is not justice, but mercy. <laughs> look at you. Look at you. No matter what your wife has done for you, you don't look that good. <laughs> well, that's, of course, Porsche, isn't it? Not Porsche the car. Porsche, P-O-R-T-I-A, in the Merchant of Venice, speaking to Shylock. If justice be thy plea, Consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. If we were simply to get what we deserve, we would get hell. How then is this eradicated, dealt with? Because Jesus Christ has stepped into that place and borne that. You say to yourself, well, this is interesting. It bears no resemblance at all to the thing you just read out of the Gospel of Mark. We thought it was going to be a nice story, and look with the way you've gone with it. That's, that's, that's tough stuff. Well, let me explain to you why I read out of it. First of all, it actually happened, you see. And it is a striking reminder of the fact that Jesus is always in the Gospels concerned about the least and the last and the left out the margins on society. Uh, the religious zealots who were very good at rules and regulations, they didn't have much time for him at all. But the people like the woman at the well who'd had five husbands and was living with a guy, she was really drawn to him. The tax collectors and the sinners and so on. And of course, since the message of Jesus, this great uh, savior and liberator had gone around, it's not surprising that four decent guys would be prepared to take their friend to meet Jesus because after all, amongst other things, he's a healer. And you know the story that they gather him there, uh, there's no room, and so they open up the roof, they let him down through the roof, and you can imagine the sense of anticipation and the chaos, and uh, there he arrives, laid out on the bed. And Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. Wow. If I was one of the four fellows, I'd be saying, hey, no, 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 no. Hey, hang on. No, we didn't come for that. No, we're not, we're not on the forgiveness thing. We're on the legs thing. We're here for legs. We're not here for an invisible forgiveness. We're here for a physical, radical healing. And meanwhile, the Pharisees, they get off on another track with it. Well, who could say he forgives sins? Only God alone. It never occurred to them for one moment that in their presence was the incarnate God. And then Jesus, of course, turns to them and says, let me ask you a question. Which do you think is easier, to say, son, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, pick up your bed and walk? Well, I think you would probably say, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because how could anybody know? Your sins are forgiven, have a great day. But if you say, rise, pick up your bed and walk, and he doesn't move an inch, you got a real problem. <laughs> and so he says, in order that you might know that the Son of Man, self-designation, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, pick up your bed, walk, and go home. And that's exactly what he did. What was Jesus doing? It's not that he was disinterested in his legs. He fixed his legs. It's not that Jesus is disinterested in politics. He established civil government. It's not that Jesus is disinterested in whether you're married or not married, or whether you've got a job or you've got no job, or whether you've got cancer. Or whatever. He's interested in all of that stuff. But what Jesus was doing was putting his finger on the man's and every man and woman's basic need the need for forgiveness. Why? Because although he made it good, it is turned bad under our role, and we are aware of the fact 
that all of our attempts throughout history, and I've only lived, I'm in my eighth decade now, I guess, so I'm old enough to remember the end of rationing after the Second World War. I'm old enough to remember when there was a Berlin Wall. I'm old enough to remember that dreadful atrocity of the Bork hearings for the Supreme Court. I'm old enough to remember what it was like when Clarence Thomas was put through that exercise. I'm old enough to remember the impeachment of Clinton and the impeachment, and so on and so on and so on. And what do I know? I know this, that education, science, politics, councils, summits, are unable in and of themselves, as you, I know, agree, to satisfy the longings of the human heart. And the problem is that if we're not careful, yes, in the land of the brave and the home of the free, if we're not careful, we start to say, in the words of Lennon and McCartney, we can work it out. We've done this before. We can do this. Let me suggest to you, we're singing the wrong song. The song we need to sing is help. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now I'm older, I'm not so self-assured. And now I've found, I've changed my mind, I've opened up the door. Help me if you can. That's what we want to say to people. In their helplessness, there is one who helps. Jesus is the helper. He's the healer. And the fact is, it's not that people have considered the evidence of these things and they found it wanting. It's just that they've never considered the evidence, that they've been made absolutely new. If we had time, we could rehearse the radical transformation in the hatchet man in Nixon's White House. Dear Chuck Colson, I revere his memory. And how, when he met with that man on the West Coast who was sharing Jesus with him, and he argued with them, and they debated things, and they thought about truth and about objectivity and so on. And, he, he, and as the man spoke to him, he said to him, you know, Chuck, the thing that stops you is one thing, pride, pride. That's your problem. And Coulson, you will know from reading his book that he left the house, he got into his car, he put the keys in the ignition, he turned it on, and he burst into tears. And he said, you know what? That man up there is absolutely right. He was intelligent. He was brave. He was a Marine. He had the ball at his feet. And he realized, actually, he had nothing. And those of us who live to know him, take us places and speak to us, realize what an amazing transformation in the life of that fellow. Now, before I come to the last word, which I must do, let me just say in passing that although our friends who do not share our beliefs regard us as being part of some kind of superstitious, primitive, bygone age of myth and um, bigotry, although we may be regarded in that way, do not allow yourself to be pinned back against the wall. We are able to say to our friends and neighbors, have you ever considered these claims? Look at this stuff. It is actually historical. In other words, it really happened. It is rational. It makes sense once you start from here. It is also universal in its appeal. It's not for a certain demographic. It's not for a white person, a black person, an Asian person, a Scots person, a Dutch person. It's for every person. Do you realize that every single person on the face of God's earth needs the gospel? Needs the gospel. Why? Well, because there's only one Savior. No one else is qualified to save. No one else dealt with sin. No one else triumphed over death. No one else ascended to the Father. No one else will ever return in power and in glory. Good, bad, new, perfect. Perfect. 